Okay, so we know that enzymes speed up the reaction by changing that activation energy. So if you think about it, regardless of how it changed that activation energy, the enzyme had to interact with something. It either had to bind to the reactants or it had to bind to the transition state. So, um, if you think about it, for an enzyme to work, it has to bind to the substrate. So in terms of conditions <coughs> or things that affect um, the enzyme activity, we can kind of lump these into two categories. Some things that affect how well the enzyme can work are external. They're things that the enzyme really doesn't have any control over. And then there are also internal properties of the enzyme that affect how it works. So if we look at the external things first, um, the first two things um, are enzyme concentration and substrate concentration. So if you think about this, um, if you have more enzyme, what do you think is going to happen to the speed of the reaction? It's going to go faster, just like you would imagine if you have more enzyme, if you have more workers, then the job gets done faster. What happens if you have more substrate? So now think about this. If the whole goal is to have the enzyme find the substrate, if you've got a solution with an enzyme and there's only two substrates and you've got another solution, so which enzyme is going to find the substrate faster? The faster the enzyme can find a substrate, the faster it can start catalyzing the reaction. So, this is also more substrate equals faster. If you think about this in terms of the quicker they find each other, the quicker the job gets done. That should make sense. Temperature and pH, um, I'm not going to have a hard and fast rule for. Um, all I'm going to say for these is that each enzyme has an optimal value. Um, for the most part, um, enzymes in humans and other mammals function best at 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit because that's our body temperature. If you look at animals that aren't um, temperature regulated, um, lizards and snakes and stuff that get really cold, um, they have enzymes that work at other temperatures. Um, bacteria that live in hot springs, um, some of their enzymes work best at 200, 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Same thing with pH. Um, if you have an enzyme that's supposed to be working in your stomach, it's going to work best at a pH of 1 to 2. If you have an enzyme that's supposed to be working in your bloodstream, it's going to work best at about a pH of 7, 3, 7, 4. So there's no one magic number. Each enzyme has its own optimal value based on where it's supposed to function um, and what it's supposed to do. So those are things that affect the enzyme activity but aren't really part of the enzyme. So in terms of what affects the substrate binding 
that's a property of the enzyme. Um, <coughs> it may seem obvious if this is your enzyme which substrate is most likely to bind to this enzyme yes. the square one the rectangle <laughs> yes I named them why yes it is S um, S1 is going to be um, is going to be the substrate that works with that enzyme that's what we mean by shape. Um, if you have a huge substrate, it obviously isn't going to work with an enzyme that has a teeny tiny active site. So when I say shape, I'm talking about shape. I'm also talking about size. Can't be too big, can't be too large. Um, when we talk about chemical properties, um, chemical properties are um, any of the things that we've talked about being polar, being hydrophobic, being charged, those are all part of the chemical properties. So let's say your enzyme has a carboxylic acid Maybe there's an amino acid, uh, amino acid, an acidic amino acid there. Now, which substrate is it likely to interact with? S2, because you're looking for complementary chemical properties. You're looking for a negative charge interacting with a positive charge. I could have just as easily um, could have just as easily just used polar residues. Um, if everything in the active site is nonpolar, you're going to want your substrate to be nonpolar. Um, that's what I mean by by chemical properties. The charge, the polarity, they should both, they should both match. So there's probably other things there, but charge and polarity are probably the bulk of, of what we're talking about. Okay, so any question on on any of that? Okay, so that at least this last part that we talked about um, is exactly what causes two things to interact together. Um, in terms of how two things interact, um, there are two different theories that describe um, how enzymes and substrates interact together. Um, for the longest time, everybody thought it was the lock and key. More people, probably just about everybody now, agree that it's probably more of an induced fit. So what's the difference? Um, a lock and key, if you think about that, the enzyme is rigid. So this is kind of like having a wooden puzzle, and you have two wooden pieces, and they just fit together. They don't have to change at all. They just fit together all. The induced fit model um, is slightly different. The basic size and shape of the enzyme active site is close to what it should be, um, but it doesn't take on the exact shape. Um, so this is a couple wooden puzzle pieces. This would be like taking a plastic piece and shoving it into a ball of clay. The hole that you shove it into was about the right size, but then when you put it into the clay, the clay kind of molds around it. Um, so one is rigid and doesn't change shape. The other has a little bit of flexibility and can change with it. So, um, why do we talk about this? The main reason for bringing this up is, again, to come back to that concept. We 
touched on it with hemoglobin. Um, we talk about these protein shapes. Um, you should realize that none of these shapes are permanent. None of them are. Um, none of them are rigid. They all have a little bit of flexibility. They can all um, change shape to any small extent.